Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Rogue Trader with me, Bregaton. Let's survey the den again and manage our motley crew. We've seen that before. The Commissar is no longer in charge of this unit. Any objections? The Commissar's former fighters shake their heads in fear. No, none, Your Lordship. There is something you must know. The man who called himself the Commissar was a traitor and an accomplice of the Xenos. His promises of escape were nothing but lies. A shocked murmur runs through the ranks. One fighter sobs, his face twisted in grief, while another whispers a string of curses, his fists clenched. One of the warriors, a woman with a stern face and a grim voice, says firmly, Then there is no hope. We are doomed to remain captives of the Xenos, but a clean death is a better fate by far. May we beg your lordship to grant us the Emperor's peace. One day we shall all die for him, not as cowards, but as heroes. My comrades, be strong in your faith and prepare to fight. The crowd erupts into emboldened shouts. Those who are ready to accept death with humble resignation a moment ago, now look up with brightened expressions, gripping their weapons and roaring battle cries in the face of a grim fate. Where did Malice keep his trophies? They are mine now. One of the Resistance fighters points to a container filled to the brim with loot. This is everything we found in this vile den. We searched all that sly Xenos' secret caches and stashes. Do I need to risk their lives? If we can keep them alive in the fight, this is fine, but the last time we had help in the arena, they all blew themselves up. In the next fight, you're coming with me. We shall make the arena drink of Xenos' blood. <laughs> Better to die for the Emperor than to live for yourself. The grim battle cry shakes the walls of the den, igniting a spark of the Imperium's light and the abominable darkness of Kimura. Make a commanding gesture. I do not wish to be disturbed. Lord Captain, I serve at your pleasure. At your approach, Abelard straightens and grunts in pain as something in his back crunches. How are you feeling? I am fit and well, Lord Captain. All that remains is for us to get out of this hellhole alive, return to our vessel, and then my answer to your question will be magnificent. You haven't seen your departed wife again. I... I have not seen her, Lord Captain. But there are times. There are times when I think I hear her laughing in the distance. Or... Or I sense hands touching me, as she used to do, to distract me from my sorrowful ruminations. But I know the difference between reality and fantasy. Now I fear, I shall simply have to learn to live with this ghost that appears only to me. With this vision of the past. Any thoughts on how we might get out of here? I am sorry to say I do not. If we had our ship and crew at our disposal, we could be safely within its walls, conduct reconnaissance of this place, and in the end, meet our deaths in battle against the Xenus as befits true servants of the God Emperor. However, we are deprived of our usual resources. Now we can only rely on our weapons and our wits. Perhaps the Emperor's Angel might share something of what he has learned during his captivity within these walls. Discover what is on his mind, but try not to anger him. Ulfar's temper is ferocious indeed. Fan Kallax could probably tell you something about our prison, but his fate is as yet unknown. Do you know anything about this place? No, Lord Captain. And trust me, I hope to remain in this state of blissful ignorance until my dying day. Just knowing that this... this abyss exists at all is enough to poison my mind. I must take my leave. Did I read... I did not read this. 
So after we ask him about his wife, uh, Abelard hesitates. After a few moments, he sighs and hangs his head. Alright, I must take my leave. Abelard nods wordlessly and closes his eyes, both out of a desire to sleep and a desire to not see his surroundings even for a short time. Rogue trader. Being reunited with the Emperor's Chosen is a balm to my soul. Have you managed to learn anything about this place? I have made no attempt to do so. What need do I have to know of the depravity of the enemies of humanity, when all I want is to burn it all in pure, raging flame? I already know all I need to. This place is evil, but there are servants of the Emperor here worthy of salvation. We need to find a way out of here. We do. And I swear to fight for that end, and not to lose hope even... even when deceit, corruption, and treachery surround us on all sides. I must take my leave. May Terra's light be with you, Rogue Trader. Let's see, your lordship, Rogue Trader, Sherin, bane of my existence and savior of my flesh. Cruel fate has driven us straight into the foulest corner of the galaxy. Home sweet home to the Drukhari scum. I have it on good authority that no one leaves this place. Not alive, not dead, not even in pieces. The grim seriousness and the thin, haggard body cannot belong to the Jehaidari that you know. Before you stands a soldier, tough and no nonsense. How are your lungs? Good as new, Sherin. No, honest. I can breathe, and I'm not coughing up blood in the people's faces anymore. You did well by me again, Sherin. Thank you. I will do my best to repay you in kind. Jai says with an ironic quirk of her brow, as she rubs the faded augmentation that has replaced her lungs and throat. So she can't quite believe that it is once again part of her body. Do you have any ideas about how we can get out of here? That's a negative, Sherin. Hatching clever plans has been the last thing on my mind recently, you see. But on the bright side, while that Ashmag homunculus, may the Ash he devour that black-souled bag of bones, was busy experimenting on me, I managed to nick a couple of trinkets from his laboratory. Here, they may come in useful, if not for escaping, then at least for surviving in this rotten hole. I am still waiting for an explanation, Jai. So what do you want to hear, Sherin? A children's tale about a beautiful princess? A ballad about a queen of thieves? How about a new story, Sherin? Once upon a time, there was a little girl who lived on a sand-covered lump of rock, and the core of that rock contained untold riches for servants of the Imperium. The girl scraped out those riches with her little hands, breaking her back and coughing up her lungs, on behalf of people who had never clapped eyes upon her, and who would never know her name. She did this every day until she turned 16, and then... Jai cringes at her own words, with all the crudeness of a veteran soldier, spits on the floor. Then his servants came and drafted the girl into the 19th Ifrit Regiment. Can you imagine? Of course, the regiment was wiped out on its first sortie. But the girl survived. The exalted one protects... So what was next? Years serving in the Astra Militarum, just a shitload of hard labor, and fighting, and deals, and shady connections, and new opportunities. Jai closes her eyes, letting the memories carry her back through the years. But everything in this world ends sooner or later, Sherin. The now not-so-little girl went and fell in with the Kasbalika. She saved up a little gold, and she even indulged in excess from time to time. Until living the good life almost cost the little girl her head after her patrons got caught in an internal investigation between the Officio Prefectus and Departamento Munitorum. So the girl ran as fast as her little legs could carry her until her eyes and the whims of fortune brought her to the expanse. A shitty story, all things considered, Sherin. Do you have a family? The folks on Footfall are my only family, Sherin. The trickster twins in the rest of the rabble, plain talking and loyal as dogs. And sometimes as dull as the pommel of a worn out blade. Jai gives an indifferent shrug. So you used to be in the Imperial Guard? 
Corporal Haidari reporting for duty, sir. I've had enough of the Astra Militarum shit to last a lifetime, Sherin. And my body's collected enough souvenirs from run-ins with Xenos and heretics to last two lifetimes. Except, when it comes to the Guard, there's no such thing as used to be. That wretched life sank its claws into me good. But that also means I remember what it's like to be a small, shaking, insignificant pawn. And that's why I appreciate what I have now all the more. Jai salutes you, but the silly play acting only sours her mood. How did you get involved with the Caspalica? What? You think it's difficult? Once me and my fellow guardsmen snuck into the upper city in search of a good watering hole where the high and mighty of that world congregated. Another time, our regiment was sent to defend the tallest spires on a hive world. And I had an epiphany. I saw how the other half lives. And by half, I mean the ones born with a diamond spoon in their mouth instead of an entrenching shovel rammed up their arse. My eyes were open to the truth, Sherin. The Imperium is full of opportunities, even for people like myself. The trick is knowing whose palms to grease, whose boots to lick, whose throat to squeeze, and whose arses to kick. I was very popular with everyone in the Guard Command, you see. I'd procure things for them, whatever they wanted. And so the Kaspalika took notice. So you're a deserter as well? You know, Sherin, I could still be bouncing around from one world to another, holed up on tired old ships with only venal grunts for company, if I hadn't decided I wanted more for my life. I accepted a shipment from the Kasbalika of certain... chemicals. You know, for carnal pleasures and the like. Some bigwig was throwing a party to celebrate his fifth decade in the service. And that's when I got the attention of the newly arrived Commissar. I was rummaging through the pockets of Astra Militarum with one hand, and shuffling the Casbalic in cargo with the other. You can imagine what would have happened to my head had the Commissar not started with my higher-ranked patrons. <laughs> Jai draws a thumb across her metallic throat and chuckles bitterly. It's even funnier that she's romancing a Commissar, then. Uh, that explains the lung implant, but what about the hand? It was orcs. <laughs> Not everything I say is a lie, Sherin. Jai makes a frustrated gesture. I see. Who the fu- mm. Never mind. Now tell me your story one more time. Once upon a- Then his servants came and took the girl into the astral- So where did you learn to read and write? The oh, literacy. My blessing and my curse. I nagged every highborn who visited our barracks on their highborn business. I pored over stamps on crates in the warehouse and the seals on every door, watched the commanders do paperwork and volunteered to help. That's how I learned, one step at a time. And then literacy became my ticket to a comfortable life. Jai sets back her shoulders, obviously very proud of herself. Is Jai your real name at least? I swear on the grave of my drunkard father who sold me into the mines and on the lives of the eleven siblings I never had, Sherin. It is difficult to say. The current Jai is a person entirely unfamiliar to you. Was there anything you did not lie to me about, Jai? There are some things I've never lied to you about. Jai slants a look at you, smiling sadly. Very well. Thank you for the answers. Like I had a choice, Sherin. <laughs> I know better than to bite the hand that pours my amasak. Jai's laugh is easy and sincere. Have you never once wanted to tell me the truth? I am more than just your patron, after all. <laughs> not once, if you can believe it. By the way, Sherin, I'm not really a princess. I'm filthy underhive scum, and I've been lying to you the whole time. I would have been flung out of your bed so fast, it would take my scream a few seconds to catch up. Jai laughs mirthlessly and shrinks away as if expecting a blow. I mean, I feel like she just answered this question, but why did you not tell me the truth immediately? For the same reason that anybody lies. I want people to like me. I want to attract them, not repel them. I insist on absolute honesty between us from here on out. Sorry, but no. <laughs> we have made no vows over water. 
And I never made any promises to keep my heart open wide before you. I have and always will have my own past and my own life. And I see no reason why you should lay claim to them. But I do promise that my secrets will never cause you harm. Jai's face turned serious. I like that response. Typically in this situation, especially in games with romances, she'd be like, okay, honesty here on out. But she said, just straight up said no. A nice change of pace. It also matches her character. About your new persona. Don't give me that look, Shirin. The plotting nobles, the scheming footfall thugs, the mysteries of Xeno artifacts, the bowing and scraping before the self-indulgent ecclesiarchy. All that's gone. Everything beyond these walls melted away like a dream. I'm fighting for my life. My soul's being torn to shreds and my body's bleeding. Is it too much to ask to want to be myself, Shirin? Jai looks at you desperately, almost pleadingly. Behave however you wish. I shall not impose my will upon you. Oh, well, thanks, I suppose. <laughs> but can I be the person I really want to be some other time, Sherin? But while we're stuck on Kamura, being a soldier just sits better with me. Can't imagine why. Alright, remain vigilant. I shall need your help yet. Sir, yes sir, your lordship, Sherin. I'll be here, all primed and ready to go. Jai's lips curve into a faint smile now that the seal of silence that has shackled them for years has finally been broken. Yes? Jai looks at you with wary eyes. Sir, yes sir. Argenta fervently whispers a prayer, calling down holy flame to cleanse this dark place in which you find yourselves. May Terra's light be with you, Rogue Trader. Lord Captain. Abelard looks at you and gives you the barest of nods. All right, hello, Ofar. Let us raise our cups at Vator, in honor of deeds accomplished and in expectation of those yet to come. Why do you call me Eight Vator? This is the name given on Fenris to a pack father, a commander or captain. An Ed Fatter answers to a Jarl, the commander of a great company. Since you are the one who commands your crew, and I follow you at present, I am granting you the honored title of Ed Fatter. So the uh, Fortress Monastery on Fenris, which is actually... Practically unassailable. It does get attacked, but it is one of the most impressive fortresses in the 40k setting. It's actually called the Eight. A little bit of trivia. It's also... And I saw if it reaches into the atmosphere. And it's a really, really impressive structure. I highly recommend looking it up and reading about the thing. It's, it's really cool. Thank you for this honor. Be worthy of it, and see that you do not disgrace this glorious rank. How are you planning on getting out of here? I have had a few thoughts on that score, but don't try to pry them out of me. When the time comes, I will share them with you. The giant space marine casts you a sidelong look, grinning broadly. Wily self-satisfaction is writ large across his harsh features, though he tries to hide it. It appears this warrior of the Emperor is blessed with brute strength, but is neither cunning nor ingenious. He is clumsily attempting to hide his total lack of strategy for escaping behind tantalizing evasions. So a common trope with the Space Wolves, especially their Primarch, Lehman Russ, is that he puts on a show of being a barbarian, but they are typically smarter than they appear. It's meant to disarm their opponents or have them underestimate them. Uh, why do you devour your enemies? Why do you think? The giant space marine grins, baring his teeth, and inquires innocently. The answer seems clear to you. This bloodthirsty warrior has simply gone mad in captivity. Come to think of it, he's probably slightly deranged even before he's taken prisoner. To sustain himself.
Is it a means of tricking your captors? Pretending to be a monster? Partly it, Fetter. It is true that I have led the puny Xenos on a false trail to dull their vigilance. But that is not the only reason. Do you know of the implant called the Omophagia? It is one of the blessings the Allfather granted to his Astartes. Nerve nodes that connect the stomach walls and the spinal cord allow me to absorb information from the genetic code of the flesh I consume. So he's specifying flesh. I always thought it just had to, had to be the brain. He had to eat the brain in order to utilize the omophagia. I have slain many Xenos and feasted on their flesh. My captors have watched me do it and taken glee in it, while I have been gathering information and planning my escape. Tell me about your brothers, the Space Wolves. Not everyone is granted the right to ask such questions, but you, I shall allow it. What do you want to know about the Astartes from the glorious Fenris? Also, the Space Wolves don't normally call themselves Space Wolves. They call themselves the Vilka Fenrika. And it's... I don't think it's confirmed. It's often speculated that Space Wolves is just a gothic translation. Uh, who are the Space Wolves? Vilka Fenrika. That is our name in the old tongue of our world. We are the fiercest of the All-Father's warriors, his executioners, his retribution. The scuttle pronouncement sounds primordial and ruthless. Our fearless Wolf King is Lehman Ross, son of the All-Father. Our world is Fenris, and our home the Fang, which rises from the world's spine into orbit. We are the thunder in the bloody storm of battle that calls to us. That is who we are. Alfar's rumbling voice seems to reverberate in your very bones. <laughs> we can call him out on the wolf thing. So it's, it's a bit of a a joke in the 40k community that everything about the space wolves is tied to wolves. The writing hardly ever leans into their space vikingness. It's always wolf this and wolf that. But there is a lot more to them than that. So I want to see what he says to this. You Fenrisians seem to bring wolves into everything. <laughs> you are not wrong there. Every other word out of a Fenrisian's mouth is wolf. <laughs> Elfar shoots you a menacing look from under his brows, but then, unable to restrain himself, bursts out laughing. But there is more to our spirit than grim destruction alone. In the Hall of Heroes, we hold feasts the likes of which you will see nowhere else. To thundering laughter, we raise our horns, tell our sagas, and honor our glorious fallen. Though the body of an Astartes is built to be immune to the effects of drink, we invented a way around this taboo. The Mjod we brew can overcome even our blood. It makes us drunk and makes our feasts jovial occasions. <laughs> ah, Mjod. You can brew it nowhere else but on good old Fenris. No other world is home to such poisonous plants. Ofar's voice drops a conspiratorial whisper. Fenris, but what is it like? Fenris is home. A harsh land of harsh winters and harsh people. When comes the hell winter, a fearsome season of frosts, the merciless world sea freezes, and great white bears, snow worms, and ice trolls go on the hunt. 
Then, the murderous frost retreats, and boats of harpooners sail out to ply their craft, capturing sea snakes and krakens. The giant's gaze thaws. And then comes the season of fire. Volcanoes awaken. Waves wash over whole islands, and only the land of Asaheim offers salvation to those whose blood and grit win them the right to live upon it. Clan fights clan, crows circle over battlefields, and wolf howls rise up to the sky. That is my beloved home. There is no place in the universe like it. Ophara concludes wistfully. Tell me, Edfator, what is the most fearsome foe on Fenris? A wily glint appears in Ophara's eye. You mentally go through the list of the deadliest creatures on Fenris, but your thoughts seem to settle on one strange name. Wrath Badger. You've read about this animal. A small and ferocious creature about which very little is known. The Wrath Badger. No, you are ri What? Why the Wrath Badger? Little is known about it. That means hunters fear to encounter it, and it is the and it is the most dangerous. <laughs> Very good. I hope to tell you about the black curse of the wolfen. But your answer wasn't bad either. Wrath Badger. <laughs> the giant warrior's chuckle slams into your chest like a strike from a sonic weapon. I find it odd he's so willing to talk about the curse of the wolfen. That's their greatest secret. I still wish to hear about the curse of the wolfen. The curse of the wolfen is the most fearsome and most terrible foe on Fenris. In the heart of every brother, there lives a dark beast, bloody and forever ravenous. He hungers to kill, not for glory or duty, or his battle brothers, but solely for the sake of killing. For he who falls to that dark beast, there is no joy or thrill in slaughter. There is but dull rancor. The guttural roar of a storm rumbles in the wolf's voice. In icons I have seen, Sardis look much less... wild. Our gene seed is unique. Laman Ross blessed us with the Canis Helix, a genetic gift that heightens our senses, making them sharper than those of brothers from other chapters. The Canis Helix kindles a bloodthirst in our hearts and changes our appearance to resemble the lethal wolves of Fenris. For a Space Marine chapter, you're far from orthodox. The wolves do not take orders from outsiders. We keep the old ways, not the Codex Astartes. We fight in packs, and we are trained and healed by our wise rune and wolf priests. We do not find honor in adorning ourselves in laurels, but instead etch the full names of our fallen kin as a promise of vengeance and draw strength from that promise. Yeah, there aren't many Space Marine chapters that don't adhere to the Codex Astartes, but the Space Wolves are one of them. And if they weren't constantly taking so many losses fighting the enemies of humanity, they'd probably be a Legion strength still, which is 10,000 Space Marines. Uh, what do you believe in? Uh, the Codex Astartes forces the previous legions to be split into chapters, which are only a thousand Space Marines strong, typically. Obviously, there's like auxiliary forces, and they have uh, other manpower besides just the Space Marines. And also, they have recruits constantly coming in to be trained for Space Marines to replenish their forces, so. Numbers a little. little uh, inconsistent. What do you believe in? We believe in the great wolves. In the deadly black mane and fierce Drakan the Thunderwolf. 
Indomitable Hagar, the mountain wolf, and in the blooded hunter. In the wolf that stalks between stars, who follows us wherever we may go. And in the uncanny two-headed Morkai, guard of the realm of the dead. Only the great wolves show us their favor. The others are more malign, but each teaches us a lesson. For that, we praise and honor them. These are some of the more famous space wolves in the setting. Uh, Black Mane is a reference to Ragnar Black Mane, who there's a series of books about. Uh, Drek and the Thunder Wolf. Uh, Hager the Mountain is an abnormally large space wolf and space marine in general. Uh, he also is like a stand-in for Thor. He has a thunder hammer he can throw that has a teleporter in it, and his gauntlet, when he throws it, can teleport back to him. And then Morkai, uh, you can actually see a motif of Morkai on the axe that he's holding. Uh, the two-headed wolf. Does that mean you do not believe in the immortal emperor of humanity as a god? The Allfather is not a god. He is the best of all humans. Our perfect forebear. His blood flowed through the veins of Lehman Ross, and Ross's blood flows in me. Does that make me a god? My respect for him has no end, and I am ready to die for him. But... Uh, what place does Faith have here? Is the All-Father like the massive Iron Wolf, whose every tuft of fur forms a mountain on the surface of Fenris? How far heaves his mighty shoulders? So a lot of, if not most, Space Marine chapters don't see the Emperor as a god. They still subscribe to the Imperial Truth, which is what the Emperor was trying to push back during the Great Crusade. He tried to deny that there were any gods, obviously denied his own godhood, and at the time, you could argue that he wasn't. But after 10,000 years of being worshipped, because faith is an actual source of power in the setting, it can influence a lot of stuff via the warp. So the Emperor has been worshipped for 10,000 years as a god, it's possible that now he actually is. But most space marines don't see him that way, as he explained here. Or is he as enormous as the Sun Wolf, which rises to hunt every morning and fills our world with light? The All Father is not a god, but the highest of humanity. Ordinary humans struggle to grasp this. But we, his warriors and offspring, remember the truth. The Imperial Truth. Uh, my character would say this. Well, I believe that the Emperor is the god of humanity and our guardian. Believe what you wish, Edvater. <laughs> the Allfather never wanted us to revere him as a god, but we are not ordinary men. I do not know what his intentions were for the rest of you. What else do your wise priests do? The Khan, the Ruined Wolf, once shared the mysteries of the healing potions and the secrets of magic sagas. He taught them to see the past and future in throne rooms, to call down storms, and to carve powerful talismans. He says not the slightest power emanating from the charms Ulfar is wearing. You spoke of full names that give you strength. What is your name in that case? Ulfar Redmane. That is what my brothers call me. After a moment's silence, Ulfar replies. I'm failing all of these. I've passed one out of, what, six? The primitive culture of Fenris could well have bestowed such a simple and banal name upon Ulfar. There's nothing to wonder at here. All you feel is pity for the space wolf. They earn their names. I understand. Do you? <laughs> and there I was, about to round off my story with a short 400 verse saga about the gifts of Lacan the Ruined Wolf. <laughs> uh, my curiosity has been satisfied. Should what I told you reach other ears, I shall take your tongue. Ofar leans toward you, with a friendly, only slightly feral grin, says, How did you end up here? 
What do you want to know? What brought the Space Wolves to the Expanse? Or how I ended up in the non-human's dark city? Why did you come to the Coronas Expanse? An Inquisitor by the name of Kalkazar put out a call for aid. My Wolf Lord did not refuse him and had two packs deployed to the Expanse. We never trusted this ally. But a blood debt for a service rendered in the past forced our hand. So it wields immense power. When it comes to the Astartes, even the Inquisition chooses to make requests rather than commands. The Space Wolves are not known for being close allies of the Inquisition. How strange then, that the chapter sent not one, but two squads in response to this request, when one squad alone is capable of crushing a planetary uprising. Two packs just like that. The Space Wolves must have taken his request seriously. Insightful. We'd had no dealings with this Kalkazar before this, and we did not trust him. Two packs meant twice as many eyes to watch out for his games and schemes. And then... You receive a wolfish grin in response. The Corona's Expanse is a wild hunting ground teeming with prey. And the Space Wolves will be the first to turn its snow scarlet. The Jarl decided to send the most indomitable hunters who hunger for honor and bloodshed. One pack would have fulfilled its duty for the sake of pride, but two... Two would seek to outdo each other for the sake of glory. What debt did you owe the Inquisitor? He uh, saved our brother who had lost the pack and uh, was unable to look after himself or the chapter's honor. Kalkazar returned our brother to Fenris and kept secret the misfortune that had befallen him. The Jarl knew that the Inquisitor's actions were driven by opportunism, and the desire to have us mighty warriors in his debt. But honor forced him to be hospitable to the stranger, and swear an oath of friendship. Alfar's voice turns cagey. Yeah, so the brother he's talking about had turned into a woofen. Most likely. Uh, why did the Space Wolves not trust the Lord Inquisitor? The Inquisition. Pah. Rats scurrying around the All Father's house and ruling it in the Master's absence. Cowards they are. The last into battle, but the first on any war council. We saw what they were worth in the months of shame. So I'm not sure if I'll explain what the months of shame are. Also, real quick, uh, Ofar nearly spits out the words. But a brief summary is that there was a battle on Armageddon between the Imperium and Chaos, and the Inquisition wanted to kill all the Imperial Guard that had fought Chaos because they want the Imperium to remain largely ignorant to Chaos because knowledge of it makes you more likely to be corrupted by it. The Space Wolves said no, and there was a small dispute. And also, one of the more impressive feats in the setting was done by their chapter master, uh, the Space Wolves chapter master, uh, Logan Grimnar. He sprinted, a full sprint in Terminator armor, and jumped. It's, it's pretty silly, but also really cool. You know the story. After the first war for Armageddon, in which the Space Wolves and the forces of Armageddon fought off the terrifying incursion of the Arch Enemy, Inquisition ordered that the heinous event be covered up, and the planet's mortal defenders be thrown into labor camps and sterilized. The wolves defended their erstwhile comrades, and evacuated many people to Fenris. The confrontation ended in a bloody massacre, and the courts of the Inquisition have not appeared in Fenris' system ever since. Also, it was really bold of the Inquisition to even go after one of the original 20 Space Marine Legions. They... Astartes pull a lot of or have a lot of power, but the original 20, well, 18, well, 9, <laughs> the numbers keep going down because there's been some changes uh, since the Horus Heresy. Uh, they, they have a lot more authority than even the other chapters. 
I don't trust him, so I'm not going to say that. But, well, this character might. I've also met Xavier Kalkazar, and I trust him. Do not be taken in, Netfrater. His words are persuasive. But until I see the blood trophies that prove his valor and loyalty, I will not be putting my back to him. That arrogant chief thought he could give us orders. But we wolves have always followed our own instincts and hunted in our own way. <laughs> I wager that boiled his blood. The red-haired space wolf chuckles smugly. But what do you know of Xavier Kalkazar's plans and objectives? In warm furs, the old man does shroud his body. In cloaks of secrets woven, shrouds the sly man his plans. To know his dire purpose, swallow not the words of poison, but his gristle. How did you end up a captive? We had gone on a raid for Xenos prisoners and fell into a trap. We had no war machines to support us, and some of our squad were wounded. So we were forced to retreat. I ordered my battle brothers to leave, but I remained behind to meet our guests. I do not know how many of the feeble wretches I slew, but I would have killed even more had their towering piles of bodies not hindered me in combat. <laughs> <sighs> they wounded me and captured me. They froze the joints in my armor. When they dragged me to their ship, two of my battle brothers descended up the Xenos and tried to free me. An insane plan, but it almost succeeded. Almost. And so there were three of us taken captive. And then there were two. And then I was alone once again. He heaves a sigh and it comes out like a growl. A grimace of pain is fixed on Ulfar's face, which is shadowed with grief. Your fallen brothers, who were they? <sighs> Their saga is one I will not sing to you. You have spilled no blood with them, nor shared with them meat and milk. Their spirits might be outraged if they knew I had sung of their deeds to a stranger. Ofar lets out a sullen growl and pins you with an icy glance that sparks something within you. Awareness of the monstrous chasm separating you and the ancient superhuman standing opposite. I'm assuming that's kind of hinting at the transhuman dread that mortals feel around space marines. What happened to the other two? They fell. With honor. Ofar says with grim curtness. I'm sorry they died. Yes. So am I. Tell me about your time in Kimura. These are dark days you are asking about, Ed Fatter. <sighs> Let my keen edge friend be a witness to the ferocity of my words. Ofar lets out a rumbling sigh, draws out the rune covered knife that you saw him carry in the Dark City, he begins to spin it between his fingers, finding his equilibrium again. I was given to Tarvantius for his amusement in the arenas of Camorra. Astartes are a rarity, and he sent me out there to kill gladiators. <sighs> Living as an inglorious butcher and a Xenos's puppet, I hated it constantly, every moment. <sighs> I had to take care of my mind before it was twisted to the seven hells. With every word, bitterness and hostility in Ulfar's voice grow. It should be grows. After roaring and raging in Fenrisian for a time, Ulfar catches his breath. Every morning I made entreaties to the Allfather, and every night I appealed to Ross. I trained my body, read the litanies, and in the darkest moments, I recited my own saga. 
I recalled every battle, every wound, every brother. And that is how I survived. The red-haired space wolf fixes you with the- I always survive. Sorry. The red-haired space wolf fixes you with a fierce a glower and then turns away. I see. This was a bleak saga, Bitfutter. Answer a few questions about yourself. Instinct bids me to remain silent. Such knowledge is not to be shared with just anyone. Only those who possess my complete trust. Ofar sucks in a breath, tasting your scent. I must take my leave. Fenris Hilda, Etfater. Let us raise our cups, Etvater, in honor of deeds accomplished and in expectation of those yet to come. Fenris Hilda, Etfater. Yeah, I'm super excited he's in the game. Space Wolves are a really awesome faction. Alright. I'm going to call it here, and next time we'll return to the Chasm. We need to go speak with Cervantius, because we have the new... bits and pieces for him. Then we'll decide what to do after that. I'm wondering if we'll ever get a... A service studs. Uh, service studs are given for every sentry uh, in service. Pretty cool. I don't remember what I said. Oh yeah, I wonder if we ever get a, a helmet for his armor or if they're purposely leaving him helmetless because he's a space wolf. They can wear helmets, but they often prefer not to. It's stifling, especially with the enhanced senses that they have. Alright, I'm going to call it here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.